Welcome to the Places and Profiles podcast, the podcast that explores the issues, stories, and people that have shaped places into what they are today. Here's your host, Adam Kamek. If you're a creator, podcaster, blogger, or someone who is trying to make money online, then one of the most effective ways to do that will be to have an email list you can write to and sell to. ConvertKit is the email marketing platform designed specifically with creators and online business owners in mind. Get your email marketing set up with ConvertKit by going to placesandprofiles.com slash convert. Hi, everybody. In today's episode, I spoke with Bob Mann about Huey Long. Huey Long is a fascinating figure who, even today, almost 90 years after his death, still looms in a large way over the state of Louisiana. Bob and I talked about Huey Long's life, his legacy, his influence on Louisiana, and in particular on LSU. Nicknamed the Kingfish, Huey Long is about as close as any American politician has ever come to leading and ruling in an authoritarian way. There are a lot of great stories and fascinating characters and nuggets connected to this conversation about Huey Long. I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Places and Profiles podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Robert Mann about the life and legacy of Huey Long and his influence on the state of Louisiana, and in particular, on LSU. Bob holds the Manship Chair in Journalism at the Manship School of Mass Communication at LSU, and he previously served as Communications Director to Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco. He is the author of the recently published book, Kingfish U, Huey Long, and LSU. You can follow his work at kingfishu.com. For more information, please check out the show notes page for this episode at placesandprofiles.com slash 10. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Great to be with you today. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, So let's just start with your idea for this book. Obviously, Huey Long is a figure who looms uh, looms large over Louisiana in any number of areas. But how did you decide to write a book about Huey Long? And in particular, why did you choose to write a book about Huey Long's influence on LSU? Well, it was it was totally kind of I was really by accident. I mean, it was just totally random. I was sitting at my desk one day about three years ago, and a friend who I've known from my involvement in politics called me. As a matter of fact, he's the among other things, he's the stadium announcer for Tigers Stadium at LSU. And he said, Hey, do you happen to know how Yui Long chose the uh, the drum majors at LSU when he was governor and senator? And and uh, this this friend had called me because my first book was a biography of uh, of Russell Long, Yui Long's son, and I knew something about the Long family from that book and my other involvement with the family. And so, but I didn't know the answer. But I pulled uh, T. Harry Williams' a massive Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Yui from 1969 down off my shelf and opened it. Up. I knew there was a book, there was a chapter in the book on on, on LSU. And, and Yui's time at LSU or his involvement with LSU. And it was 34 pages. And by the time I finished reading that chapter, I knew there was a book there. I just, I, I couldn't believe that that this book hadn't already been written. And I was kind of doubting maybe I had missed it. And I, when I went to my colleagues at LSU Press to propose the idea, they had the same reaction. We can't believe anyone, no one's written this book before. This is just sort of low-hanging fruit, an idea hiding in plain sight. And um, so I'm really grateful to that friend for calling me because I was at the time just sort of casting about trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my next project. And it just got delivered to me on a silver platter. At least the idea did. Well, that that's that's fantastic. Um, so people who are listening who are not from Louisiana, which would be the vast majority of the audience, uh, they maybe have vaguely heard of Huey Long. Maybe they haven't. Um, but for people who really don't know much about this man and his legacy, uh, we'll get into more specifics, obviously, here in a little bit. But can you give a, a brief overview of who he was and why he's so significant that you would write a book about him all these years later, that you and I would be sitting here talking about him all these years later? Well, it's, it's a very good question for especially someone outside Louisiana, but even inside Louisiana, it's been so, so long. Um, so the Yui Long and the Long family, the political organization that that he created starting in the, the like 1918, when he first was elected to public office in Louisiana, really dominated Louisiana politics for most of the 20th century. He was governor and U.S. senator until he was assassinated in 19. 19- 35, but his political organization 
well, let me back up. When he was when he was governor and when he was senator, he took over Louisiana and and, and ruled Louisiana uh, with an with an iron hand. He he was um, probably the closest to a dictator that that we've ever seen in this in this country. He certainly was an authoritarian. He had total control of Louisiana politics, uh, Louisiana government, down to the to the local level in many cases. Um, but that authoritarian control uh, was in many ways benevolent. I mean, he delivered a, a lot of services to Louisiana, changed people's expectations for what government could do for them because it hadn't really been serving anybody but the really wealthy people in Louisiana, particularly the oil industry and other major uh, business interests in the state really weren't doing anything for the average person. And that meant roads and bridges and schools and just basic government services that other states were beginning to have or already had that Louisiana just was, had been left behind and long delivered a lot of that. And his organization after his death continued to deliver that. And um, his, his brother, Earl, his younger brother, Earl, served three terms as Louisiana governor after Long's death. Uh, Yui's son, uh, Russell, served for 38 years as a United States senator from Louisiana from 1948 to 1987. And a whole whole host of other Longs served in Congress uh, uh, through the 20th century. And so it was a it's it's you know, he he was sort of a, a shooting star in many ways. He died. He was only 42 when he died. But the legacy he left in government and what government could do and would do for people and the family legacy of uh, political involvement uh, at almost every level of, of state and national government lasted until until Russell Long and, and, and his cousin Gillis Long, who was a, a leader in the House, U.S. House, um, uh, left the scene in the, in the latter part of the 20th century. Now, you mentioned that he ruled with an iron fist and that it was almost as if he was a dictator or an authoritarian in his style of leadership and his style of rule. Uh, can you maybe give a give a couple stories that illustrate that or go into a little more detail to illustrate exactly what that looks like and why his style of politics and his style of governing was so different in the context of what we might ordinarily be used to in the U.S.? Well, a couple of a couple of examples. Uh, first, he um, so so a, a little bit of prehistory. Um, he was the 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 legislature, the House tried to impeach him in 1929, and they failed because he they didn't weren't, weren't able to convict him in the Senate. And after that, I think he he changed his views of what it would take to get things done in Louisiana. He he. Um, it really did change his personality. And I think he, he reassessed how how hard it would be to, to do what he wanted to do to enact his plan. And so he took he took an, a different, in, in many ways, a different route to, to political power, which is, you know, he said before the impeachment, I used to, you know, ask for permission. Now I dynamite him out of my way. And it, uh, people around him did say that, it, that that impeachment experience really did, did change his personality and his governing style. So it was it became all about uh, consolidating power after that. And, um, and he was pretty, you know, um, ruthless and, and, uh, and efficient in doing that to the point that by, by the time he died, uh, he had control, the state government had control well, by the, I should back up by the time he died, he was a United States Senator still running Louisiana government through his puppet governor. Okay. Allen, um, in those days, the governor could only serve one, one consecutive term. So, uh, he he went to the U.S. Senate, but he did not give up control of Louisiana or Louisiana State University, which was a big part of his interest when he was when he was governor. So he was consolidating power down to the local level. So that the one of the last special sessions that he presided over again, when he was a United States senator running the state, was to give him authority to appoint to fire and hire and fire all local officials in in, in Louisiana and some Louisiana uh, towns and cities. He had the authority to hire and fire every school teacher in the state. Um, and so um, people from all walks of life were really concerned about not crossing him. And so it, it, it became a um, there was a lot of fear uh, because people were people's livelihoods depended on state government or they had a, a relative whose livelihood depended on state government. And so the, the, the opposition to him just sort of collapsed in a way because because people were not sure what kind of retribution Long and his organization would take against them if they if they if they opposed him. 
And um, so, you know, his assassination in 1935 was was almost, uh, um, in, in many ways, I think you're looking back on it, you realize it was kind of a foregone conclusion that someone was going to kill him um, because people felt in this, especially here in, in a town like Baton Rouge, where I am, that they were powerless to stop him any other way. That doesn't certainly doesn't justify assassination in any by any stretch of the imagination. But there were a lot of people um, in, quote unquote, respectable Baton Rouge New Orleans society who really weren't all that upset by the idea of, of, of murdering this guy. And when he died, uh, his funeral here in Baton Rouge, uh, his, the funeral of the, the assassin, I should say, the funeral of the assassin here in Baton Rouge was was by far the best attended funeral of any American political assassin in our nation's history. It was attended by a former governor, the district attorney, the congressman, and the former dean of the LSU Law School who long had thrown out of his job. And every it, it, the, the, the reporter who was covering the funeral wrote that it looked like every physician in town was there to pay honor to this guy, the guy who just killed the United States senator. So it was he he really divided people. Um, but even after his death, pe- there were there and even till today, there's still a pretty vigorous debate in Louisiana about whether his rule was um, on on balance was was better for the people or worse. That he that that he, despite his his awful author- authoritarian tactics, there are people you still get a pretty good debate in political circles about this whether whether on balance he did more good than bad. Well, and a lot of the the good, um, I suppose, comes from his populism uh, yeah. and some of the populist uh, policies that he advocated for that you mentioned earlier. And uh, he had the slogan, every man a king. Um, and I guess that sort of notion of speaking to the common person would be at the at the core of arguing uh, on the positive for Huey Long. It, it was. It was a real it was a really soak the rich um, chicken in every pot message. And he took it nationally. So the thing that I didn't talk about is that by the time he was assassinated, he was plotting to run for president, probably as a third party candidate in 1936. Um, and um, and so he had from his platform in the Senate, he had really taken his he called that our share our wealth program nationally. And there, and he wanted one of the things he wanted to do, he wanted to impose a 100 percent income tax on on all income above a million dollars a year. And, uh, and and share that wealth with with people uh, uh, with with average people. Um, you know, we, I, I think that a lot of most economists think that politically and economically that that was a an unworkable um, plan. But politically, it was it was it was very appealing, and it was sort of characterized his approach to government, which was uh, and when he was governor to tax the oil industry, tax Standard Oil, and share that wealth. And when he became and became a U.S. senator to to challenge uh, Franklin Roosevelt to and, and really I think force Roosevelt to move much farther to the left than he was comfortable doing earlier in his early in his time as president. On the flip side of things, on the ne- on the negative side of things for Huey Long, uh, we met, we discussed earlier about the Iron Fist notion and his ruling as almost an authoritarian dictator. Uh, but there are also various scandals, allegations of corruption, nepotism. So what exactly? What happened there? What were what were some of those allegations and scandals? Well, first of all, I, I should say that there 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 certainly were allegations of corruption and inside dealing and nepotism and all that. Probably no more than you would have seen on the other side. So Long was probably not, you know, any he was probably not distinguished in his in his way of rewarding his friends and punishing his enemies. That was what politicians in Louisiana. Have been doing for generations, and you know, in many, many ways, still do. As and, and that's just not that's not a Louisiana thing, by the way. I think we we can agree on that. Um, the corruption, I think, the most credible charges of corruption against Long um, probably came after his death. I mean, there were attempts by the Roosevelt administration to 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 try to catch him in income tax evasion, and that didn't succeed. The prosecutor that uh, a former governor of Texas that that the Roosevelt administration uh, recruited to to be the pro- be the person to prosecute Long refused to prosecute him, refused to indict him because he said he didn't think he could get a conviction and he couldn't he couldn't prove that he had um, that he had uh, that he had engaged in income tax evasion and even and he said even if we did I don't think a jury in Louisiana would convict Huey Long for that um, the, most of the corruption. Uh, happened after Long's death, or the most credible 
examples of corruption where people were actually sent to prison happened after Long's death. And, and, and it was almost five years after his death. Um, and a lot of it involved LSU. And that is that's sort of the, the way the, the sort of the book ends with, with you know, Long um, sort of keeping it all under control and keeping the avarice to an acceptable level. Um, and, and I think Long recognizing that he had a lot of that he had a lot of shady people around him or people who, that, who if, if, if he didn't control their worst instincts, that they would, that they would wind up in prison. In fact, he, I found a half dozen examples of long telling people if, if, if I, if I die, some, some variation of this statement, if I die tomorrow, half these people are going to wind up in prison. So he recognized that he had some, he, he recognized he had some people around him that he needed to control, but it does seem like he managed to, con- he managed to control him. I found a number of examples of, you know, his attention to detail and what was going on at LSU, where he was concerned that the president, that he, his handpicked president, James Monroe, Monroe Smith and his wife were maybe living a little too uh, lavishly for Baton Rouge standards and took very decisive actions to shut some of that stuff down because he thought it just, it, it looked bad and it reflected badly on, on him and the university. So I, I think there is evidence that Long did, um, that did sort of police his, his organization in a way that, you know, he recognized that it could cause a lot of problems. And one, and once he was gone, a lot of those the people that Long was worried about did end up going to, going to prison. And it didn't all involve LSU, but a lot of it was about LSU, about just, they just stole, they just, they just stole LSU blind and in, in all kinds of different ways. Now, a few more things that I want to look at to provide context on Huey Long and who he was, and then we'll have the rest of the conversation focus almost exclusively on LSU, since that's at the core of your book and you work at LSU and obviously have a you know particular interest in that in that university. Um, but something that uh, we haven't talked about yet, but that is key to I guess kind of the imagery and the perception of Huey Long is his nickname. Kingfish. So where does that come from? And, and what does that say about who he was and how he's viewed? Well, there was a, in the thirties, the most popular radio um, show comedy uh, in America was Amos and Andy. And it had a character in it called the Kingfish, who was the, sort of the, the, the character in the show who's always getting Amos and Andy into trouble. Um, he was a sort of a shady businessman. And it was, you know, the really popular comedic character and everybody knew the name and it just became a, became a nickname. I mean, you know, there's, I think every family's got a weird nickname and, and you know, that they're, everybody, you know, has got, there's some weird nickname and, and some sort of um, a sh- uh, very foggy origin story for how that nickname came about. Um, so I don't know if it was long said, I want to be known as the Kingfish or people around started calling him the Kingfish, but it was because of Amos and Andy. And it caught on really quickly because he embraced it, and he would he would call himself the Kingfish. People say he would, you know, he would when they when he called them on the phone, he would identify himself not as Yui, but as Hey, this is the Kingfish. So he he embraced he embraced that that nickname, and it and it and it has stuck until today. Around Louisiana, people, you know, I, I don't find that's not a question. I mean, I think it's a good question to ask. How did the name nickname come from? But it's interesting to me that almost a hundred years later, that people around Louisiana are really intimately aware of who the Kingfish is and they don't, and most people don't, don't know much about Amos and Andy. They, when they hear Kingfish, they think of Huey Long, not Amos and Andy. In those days, it would have been outside of Louisiana. It would have been just the opposite. They would have immediately thought of the character in the show. Sure. Um, one other thing I want to look at before we focus on LSU, uh, and since we're about to focus specifically on, you know, things that happen in Baton Rouge, uh, where LSU is located, um, there's a, giant landmark in Baton Rouge that is there in large part because of Huey Long's doing, and that's the Louisiana State Capitol, the tallest Capitol building in the U.S. How did that come about, that he would build the tallest Capitol building or have the tallest Capitol building built when the previous Louisiana Capitol building was not that old um, and in many ways it seems to have still been been workable? So why why did he decide to build this you know giant uh, this giant Capitol building taller than any, any other Capitol building in the country. Well, he had grand ambitions. He wanted, you know, like a lot of politicians, he wanted monuments to himself. And, um, the, the building was when, when Long was governor, the building and the building's still there. It's a political museum now, uh, in, in, in Baton Rouge, right on the banks of the state Capitol. Um, it had, it was, it was, it needed repair. It needed, it needed renovation and it probably could have been renovated. 
it's not a it's not all that big certainly compared to this to the current capital um some people believe that that, that one of the reasons why he wanted to uh, abandon it and build a new capital is because he was impeached in that building and he wanted that it was sort of a reminder of his you know near humiliation and 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 ruin um but, you know, I think he just wanted a monument to himself. He wanted he wanted a grand building. Uh, I think he thought it made a statement about Louisiana in the same way that I think he he thought that that in, that that lifting up LSU into national prominence made a statement about that Louisiana was was moving out of the uh, 19th century firmly into the 20th century with with a modern university that uh, that was embracing the world and that that this statement with this with this capital was was doing the same thing. And and you know we can get into this later, but the the two LSU and the and the, and the new state capital are intimately connected because the um, Louisiana State University was in and around the, the 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 location of the current state capital. That's where the old campus was, and in order to uh, finance the construction of uh, of the of the um, of the of the current state capital. Uh, LSU uh, sold sold that land, or at least a part of that land, to the state to build the capital, and that's how LSU was able to finance its construction. Uh, it's it, a lot of its construction in its current site, so they were they were intimately connected. But I think he wanted a monument, and it's and it is a monument. In fact, you know, he's buried on that on the property. He's he's buried in front of the Capitol in a, in a grand, enormous monument statue. Uh, over his grave that is still every night lit by a spotlight on that shines down on it from the top of the building. Well, and of course he was assassinated in this and monument he was as well. Assassinated in the, or he was, he was shot in the, yeah, in the hallway of the, right outside the governor's office on the first floor. Right. Um, so let's, let's turn our focus now to LSU. And if, it's not uncommon for a governor or a prominent political figure in a state to take an interest in colleges and universities in that state to have a rooting interest in their athletic programs to want what's best for schools that they care about. But it seems like Huey's ro- Huey Long's role with LSU was far greater and far more involved than what we would see from a normal governor or political figure who is advocating for an important university in their state. So what are some of the many ways that we see Huey's influence cast over LSU. And I know you mentioned that he wanted to you know, rise up LSU's stature and that he thought that that would help the state of Louisiana's stature. But why does he decide to take just such a um, an all-encompassing, I guess we could say, uh, hold on the university? Well, some of this is conjecture because he didn't, he, he never, he never really explained it in a way that you know, it would just sort of it seemed to happen organically. So a lot of this is is uh, reading tea leaves. But one of the tea leaves that that I that I I like to read that I think makes some of the most. It's not the only reason, but I think it makes a lot of sense to me. Is uh, and I didn't know you know any of this history before I started working on this book. Is it wasn't an interest of mine, and I, I find it fascinating. But it just wasn't something that I knew about, and that is the history of uh, of Southern college football in the early 20th century and how um, disparaged it was as a as a sport by uh, by the eastern and western uh, and, and, and midwest uh, uh, sports writers um, I the, the way I like to when I tell people around here the way I like to describe it is they looked that the 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 New, the New York sports writers looked on southern college football in the 19, early 1920s, like um, the English, the, the British press looks upon uh, so- American soccer. We, we're, we're technically playing the same sport, but we're but it's but it's really bears almost no comparison. I mean, it's, they just don't think it's they think it's an inferior uh, copy of what they do. And and in many cases, it was because college because football didn't really have a tradition in the South. There were a lot of young men who would show up to. Um, uh, to their campuses or uh, throughout the South and, and volunteer, you know, g- go to join the football team and had never played a football game in high school, uh, ne- didn't know anything about football. And, uh, and so in many cases, the, the, 
the way that the, the sports writers looked down upon football was was justified. It really wasn't all that impressive, but it began to be to, to be impressive in ways that was, I think, were deceiving to a lot of um, of these sports writers. And so by the mid-1920s, there was a, there were some really good Southern football teams that still weren't getting the credit that they deserved nationally. And one of them was Alabama, uh, that had an undefeated season in 1925, um, allowed only one touchdown the whole season. Um, and scored, I think, uh, almost 300, more than 300 points and, and allowed only seven points. And under, the, by far the best team in, in college football in the country. And yet they could not get an invitation to play in the Rose Bowl until four other teams turned the Rose Bowl down to go out to, to uh, Pasadena and play the University of Washington. So Alabama gets the invitation. No one thinks they can, that they'll, they'll be able to, to, to hold their own against the University of Washington. No one expects them to, to win the game, and they go win the game. And then they go back the next year, and no one expects them to be able to hold their own. They thought it was a fluke, and Alabama fights Stanford to a, to a tie. And um, around the same time, uh, Georgia Tech is, going to, is getting an invitation to the Rose Bowl. And remember, the Rose Bowl was the only postseason game in, in college football in those years. It was the national championship game. Um, uh, Georgia is going to um, Yale and beating Yale in the Yale Bowl uh, after having lost four years in a row. And so suddenly uh, 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 college football in the South is becoming something to be respected. And, and the whole South from, from Texas to Virginia is, ce is celebrating wildly when Alabama wins that first Rose Bowl game because it seems to be a vindication of the entire South. So I think it's, you know, Huey Long, you know, was paying attention to all this and, and seeing that, that places like Alabama and Georgia and Georgia Tech and, you know, also places like Swanee, which had a pretty good football team, a really good football team in the early 20, in the, you know, in the teens, but we're getting lots of really great attention and we're, we're raising up the profile of their state colleges, but also their states. And he wanted, he want, he wanted that for, for Louisiana and LSU was was the way to get it because you know Tulane was was another team that was 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 making waves nationally. They got a Rose Bowl invitation in in 1932, um, but this was the state school and this was the school that that had the most that had the greatest potential for long to you know to take credit for its improvement. Tulane was a great school already. It was the 300 pound gorilla in Louisiana. So if you're gonna if you're going to, you know, ride a, a school's athletic program to national fame, LSU was the natural um, school to adopt. And so, uh, I don't think it's the only reason that he took an interest in LSU. But I think, you know, like a lot of governors and politicians and athletic programs today, recognize that the, in, in many ways, the fastest way to national renown is on the backs of a successful football season, and. Um, and so, I, so long. His his first among the first things he did was to take over the football team. It wasn't the only thing he did. He, he created one of the one of also one of his first actions was to create a, a medical school for uh, LSU in New Orleans, and it was to replace the president. And was to, you know he did a lot of other stuff in, in, in instituting a building program to expand the, the university to you know to increase the size of the of the of the of the new campus where it is now. But he took an inordinate interest in the football team from beginning to end, and it really was the vehicle that raised LSU's profile. It wasn't the only reason that people respected LSU by the mid-30s, because he did improve, he did find the resources to improve it academically and otherwise. But it really did, it really, it really did happen on, or at least start on the backs of that football program. Well, and even in following years, the notion of lifting up a college football program to improve the profile and identity and visibility of a state, uh, it's something that we continue to see today, that we continue yep. to see in the immediate aftermath of that. Um, recently, I interviewed the state historian of Oklahoma, and he mentioned to me that in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, one of the things that people in Oklahoma did in order to improve the reputation of the state after all that they had been through during that uh, during that tumultuous time period was invest heavily in the University of Oklahoma's football team, go hire Bud Wilkinson as the coach there, and put put a product on the on the field that could go win championships. Uh, we still see this sort of thing today. The you know football team at Alabama is very yep. influential in the way that state is viewed, and there are other places where the football team is on the decline. 
such as Nebraska, maybe where that also is having a a, a view, um, uh, an impact nationally on how the state uh, is viewed. So it's it's interesting that this has kind of been a common thread using college football as a way to affect the visibility and the prominence of a state. Um, but with Huey Long's role in the football team, uh, it was you know very very involved as you alluded to in your response there, and it goes a little beyond just wanting them to do well what are what are some of the specific <laughs> ways that he was heavily involved because th- this was not a typical politician and not a typical fan this was very much hands-on um getting involved in the the nitty-gritty on game day uh on the sidelines what were some of the ways that he was that he was so heavily involved here yeah so the first thing he did was in in november of 1930 he tried to fire the football coach uh who was russ cohen who had been the 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 top assistant to wallace wade who was the coach of alabama and um and lsu had hired cohen to try to recreate what uh, uh, Wade had done in Alabama. This was before Huey Long. Huey in- inherited this guy. And Huey quickly judged him to not be a really effective, not so much a, an effective uh, football mind, but an effective motivator of young men and wanted to get rid of him. Um, and so they, the, one of the first things he did, and he, they, on one day he hired a new president, fired a band director, and, 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 and basically fired the football coach. Uh, Cohen ended up saving his job for one more year by almost beating Tulane the following week and sort of, you know, saving his reputation and and saving his job for another year. But after that, Long really got involved in the football program in in more in more ways than just, uh, you know, just trying to decide who the coach would be. Long would would go uh, to would travel with the team. He saw himself as as a coach. He saw himself as the sort of the chief motivator of the team. And, and, And again, I think he he correctly judged Cohen. From what I can tell, Cohen was was really not a very, you know, um, inspiring person, inspiring speaker. He couldn't really give a, a halftime speech to rouse his team to to, to rally uh, when they were behind. And, and Long could, Long could do that. Long didn't know much about football, but he knew how to motivate young men and, and people. And so he would he would sort of barge into the to the locker room and, and take over that uh, role. And he was getting some credit in the in the uh, in the press, in the Louisiana press, for inspiring the team to rally in some games. And so he, you know, he would, he was getting positive reinforcement for that. So he, he, he began to not only do that, but see himself as uh, truly as a, as an assistant coach of the team to the point that he would um, he was giving the coaches uh, plays. He would draw up these X's and O's and hand them in. And I don't think the coaches knew where they were coming from, but, but it b- became apparent to, uh, later that, that he was cribbing them out of Collier's magazine. Um, that, that was a magazine that would run football plays from college, you know, six, good college, you know, successful college football plays. And Long would, would crib them and turn them in. And he would go around asking other, other coaches um, of other teams to give him some plays and he would hand those in. And um, he um, would, um, you know, he came up with, um, all kinds of, he would, he would, you know, he would, there's this great example of, he was worried that the team, and I can't remember which, which game it was, might've been the annual Arkansas game in, in Shreveport, but he was worried that if, if, if LSU fell behind, that it needed a trick play. And so they devised some, some trick play. I'm not really clear if it was truly a play or they just came up with some hocus pocus to make him think they had something, but they called it 1099. And he goes to the coach on the sidelines and says, how come you hadn't called 1099? And the coach says, well, you know, because we don't really need to. We're two, two touchdowns ahead. But he said, I've been trying to call it because the signal to the coach was I'll take my, I'll take my hat off, run the play, and the, and the quarterback isn't, isn't paying me any attention. So Long starts running up and down the side of the field screaming, call 1099, call 1099. And, I, you know, I, that story and some of the other sideline antics that he was doing where he was – where he was berating the coaches, where he was, where he was really kind of coaching the team during the game. I didn't realize until I got pretty deep into my research that that was, that 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 was a a really awful violation of college football rules in, in the 1930s when coaches were not allowed to do that kind of stuff on the sidelines. Their job was to coach during the week and let the players run the game during the game. They weren't allowed to call plays. They weren't allowed to really tell the players anything during the game. 
except at halftime. And here's Huey Long running up and down the field, engaging in all these crazy antics, you know, just violating every every rule, uh, berating the berating the referees for uh, 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 penalties that he disagreed with. And uh, I think the only reason that he got away with this was number one that he was the governor of the state, and they probably were you know hesitant that the referees were hesitant to take action against the governor of the state. But maybe it was also because he technically wasn't a coach. He was just a just a you know just an exuberant fan who barged onto the to the um, to the sidelines and was injecting himself into the game. But he technically wasn't a coach. But had he been a coach, he would have been in violation in almost every game of about ten different different rules for coach conduct during the during the game. But it attracted a lot of attention, national attention. And I think the other one, I think one of the other reasons he did it was not so much because he um, he, he you know, I don't I think he knew he didn't know much about football, but he created the illusion that he was that he was sort of in, that he was sort of instrumental in LSU success that he was that he really was sort of pulling the strings uh, and that he was really he was really responsible for some of LSU's uh, success on the football field. And it allowed the the public to see him not through the lens of politics, but uh, through the through the lens of of his sports fandom, his football fandom. And he got a lot of you know he got a, he got a lot of press from sports writers that he wasn't getting, and a lot of good press from sports writers that he wasn't getting from the political writers. In some cases, he was being shut out of these these newspapers on the political side. And he found his way back into the news through uh, through the coverage of LSU football games. So I think another reason, another answer to your earlier question was why did he get so involved was because he was being shut out of the press and he realized that you know, the sports writers will, will cover me in ways that the political writers won't. Well, and you touched on this a little bit very briefly, but football was not the only part of the game day experience in which Long took a very strong interest. He also shaped the, the band program at LSU in any number of yes. ways. What are some of the ways that that happened and why did he take such an interest in LSU's band? Well, I think, you know, like he was, a, he understood spectacle. He understood that, you know, that, that people want to want to be entertained. And I think he, and, and probably in, in ways that, you know, football, football games weren't as, as uh, exciting in those days as they are now. We think of the football, maybe we, maybe some people think football has always had halftime shows with bands marching around and, you know, all this entertainment. And it really wasn't that way in those days. It was, it was pretty businesslike. You know the football, the players go and stir up a bunch of dust, and there's you know there there and, and, and until the 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 twenties and thirties, it wasn't it wasn't um, common for the bands to march on the field and you know doing a halftime show. It just wasn't a thing. Uh, but and and Long wasn't the one who originated this, but I think he was he he was the person at LSU to recognize that the band could be an instrument of entertainment, not only at the game but uh, but before. Before, after, and, and during the game, you know that um, the first thing he did was he recognized the band was too small. It was just it was thirty seven. It, it was a small uh, sort of ragtag thirty seven person unit, and um, it needed to be bigger. It needed to have a bigger, better sound. It needed just to impress people more. So he, the first thing he did was hire a new band director who who sort of had his vision, and they began recruiting more students for the band. So by the time Long dies, the band had gone from being thirty seven. Um, members to being almost to over two over 150 close to 200 um, and it had bigger better sound and so when they would um, when the LSU uh, would go um, to play in, in places like Houston and Jackson and Nashville and other in other places uh, um, West Point another another example they take the band with them and have a parade um, they stayed they did they did parades down Fifth Avenue in New York they paraded from the train station to the hotel or the, or the stadium and a lot of other towns and hundreds of thousands of people would turn out to see this because long would be at the, at the front of the uh, parade uh, leading the van as the drum, you know, sort of uh, ahead of the drum major. And uh, it would be quite a spectacle. Um, the most famous example is when he took the, took the cadets and a lot of the student body and the band uh, on, on uh, a train odyssey from, from Baton Rouge to Nashville for the 1934 uh, LSU Vanderbilt game, and he let it. He let it. He he planted news that when when in Nashville he might announce for president. So national and and certainly um, and, uh, Tennessee uh, sports writers were were fascinated by this whole thing. And uh, over a hundred thousand people showed up to see this parade of LSU arriving at the at the train station and marching to the War Memorial and holding and doing a, doing a band concert there. 
it just was a spectacle. It, it was entertainment. And um, he would sometimes take the band on the road for, for, for just performances and parades that didn't, weren't associated with a football game. He did that for a couple of times in New Orleans. Um, yeah, he recognized uh, that the band was, and, and, and by the way, the band at LSU is still uh, as, is, is, is about as popular as the football team. I mean, people come out to see the band and are fans of the band in, in, in ways that, you know, you may find that at other schools, but, but uh, the band is really, really popular at LSU. And it, and I think that goes back to the days when, when long recognized that the, that the, uh, the role of the band in, in creating that uh, enthusiasm and spectacle was, uh, was really important. And he was, you know, long knew more about music than he knew about football. So I think he also recognized some, you know, he recognized that, um, that, you know, he, when he hired this last of, of his four of his three band directors, he was really looking for someone to turn the band into more of an orchestra, uh, that, that, that played popular tunes. And that's exactly what he got in Castro Carrazzo. One of the best ways to make money online is via email marketing. Even with the prevalence of social media use, building an email list and writing interesting, informative, and entertaining emails as part of a strategy to sell to the people on your list is still possibly the best and most effective way to make sales and increase your revenue. I use ConvertKit for my email list with the Places and Profiles podcast, and I highly recommend it. ConvertKit is a tremendous platform with a great reputation and is designed specifically for creators, bloggers, podcasters, and online business owners. ConvertKit has tremendous functionality and is very intuitive and easy to use. Get your email marketing set up today for your blog, podcast, or online business by going to placesandprofiles.com slash convert. Again, that's placesandprofiles.com slash convert. All right, so let's shift back towards the academic side of LSU and Long's involvement there. And you mentioned earlier that uh, he helped ensure that a medical school got established in New Orleans that was affiliated with LSU. Uh, we also mentioned earlier that he, in general, just had a, an interest in education, free textbooks for uh, Louisiana students of all of all sorts, um, and really trying to lift up education uh, across the state. And a lot of that um, goes back to his approach towards uh, having the common person in mind and uh, trying to alleviate poverty um, and and uh, income disparity, uh, the soak the rich mentality. But on the opposite end of the coin, while he had this focus and interest in education, and while he wanted to improve LSU's academic reputation or to boost the school's visibility uh, nationally, establish this medical school in New Orleans. Um, on the opposite end of the coin, he almost cost LSU its accreditation. What's the story there? What what exactly happened with that? Well, he was getting involved in, in the school in a lot of ways that were, that they sort of crossed over. And the way, I, the way I talk about it, when I try to sort of describe it to audiences around here is that when he went from being the, the, the head cheerleader to the head coach is when he got the school in trouble. And I'm not talking just about fo- I'm not talking about footballs because what he was doing with football was was harmless in a, in a lot of ways. But he really saw himself, I think, as the president of the university that the that the that his president James Monroe Smith was was his assistant, and uh, that Long was giving Long was making the decisions, Long was making the orders. As long as he was governor, um, he could kind of get away with that because the governor was an ex officio member of every state board. So Long and Long took that seriously when it came to the LSU Board of Supervisors, and he attended every meeting. Um, that he could, and almost every meeting, I think, held of the LSU board while he was governor. And he was not a passive participant in that, in those, in those meetings. He really ran them. Um, And when he was governor, he could probably get away with that because that was, you know, there was a constitutional role for him to play. But when he, when he left the the governor's office and became a U.S. Senator, um, it was a little, it was a little more, it was a little less clear, even though the governor, the, his, his handpicked governor, okay, Allen appointed him to, the, to the board, which was kind of an odd situation, having a, a sitting U S Senator serving on the governing board of the state's university. Um, but he, and even that probably wouldn't have attracted the ire or the attention of the, of the accreditation bodies, but he started, he started going around bragging that I'm in charge of LSU and um, he started running off um, deans and other people that he didn't like, um, 
the Reveille, the student newspaper, ran. It's, a, it's sort of a, a long, involved story, but he long appoints a football player to the state senate, and the student newspaper runs a letter to the editor critical of the whole situation, and long erupts and demands that the paper um, retract or you know destroy those copies. Um, two dozen um, journalism students are suspended for for how they protested that, and eventually seven editors of the student newspaper are expelled from the university for their um, refusal to go along with long censorship of the paper. That attracts a lot of attention. Uh, that gets LSU, begins to get LSU in trouble for Long's, you know, uh, uh, over-involvement in, in, in academic affairs. Then Long tries to, Long runs, runs the um, law school dean off, who he judged to be an anti-Long, and he, he was. Um, but he tries to hire, and this is again, when he's a United States Senator, he tries to hire his replacement by a long, on a long distance phone call, having heard of the, of the candidate's name 10 minutes earlier, he just calls this guy up. He's been recommended by someone that Long respects and Long calls him up and offers him the job. And the accrediting body for the law schools find out about this and realize that the, that, 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 that institution has lost institutional control. So you have these, by the time Long is assassinated, you've got the Sachs accrediting body, which is still our accrediting body to LSU, um, moving toward um, putting LSU on probation and and maybe maybe costing LSU's accreditation, and then you've simultaneously got the accrediting body for the for the law school for all American law schools who are who are coming down on LSU. And if Long had lived, I think it's possible that one or both of them would have, would have, the school over the school, overall school would have gotten in trouble. Um, the law school would have gotten in trouble, maybe lost its accreditation. But when Long is assassinated in September of 1935. Those two investigations go away because Long's influence has has disappeared, and so you know he took this he took this this sort of mediocre school to great heights and then almost to almost to ruin in the course of about five years. It's quite an arc for the for this university, and only his death saves it from from that near ruin. Well, and another way that he influenced the academic side of things at LSU, and you briefly touched on this, but was with the whole issue of academic freedom, uh, yeah. where he insisted that faculty members and students not criticize him. You you obviously told a story in your last response that dealt with this, but can you go into a little more detail? What did academic freedom look like during this time period at yeah. LSU, and how did Huey Long deal with critics of his that were on the campus? So uh, there was... Um, the, the one I, I have a chapter about a, a English professor who who wrote a novel that a Catholic priest here in town didn't like, thought it it disparaged the the, the coeds of the campus, and and got the guy got raised enough hell to get the guy fired, and Long supported that. So that was sort of the first indication that Long really wasn't all that respectful of of academic freedom. The guy ended up hiring the ACL, getting the ACLU's help, and getting his job back, but it but it. It was a, it was an early sign that Long was not um, Long did not didn't respect or understand academic freedom or care about it. And then um, it, it it was it one of the one of the, really one of the this wasn't public I don't think at the time at least I, I couldn't find it was public but one of the first things he he asked his new president James Monroe Smith to do was to fire all the anti Long faculty members. And I think Smith you know Smith was a was a PhD he you know he he was an, he was a, a real academic. Um, he he recognized how bad that would be, how that how how bad that would be for LSU, and he and he he held Long off and 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 you know worked the situations so that Long didn't didn't end up doing that. But but this that was Long's inclination from the beginning was to purge the school of all of the anti-Long faculty members. So eventually, what I think happened is that it, the word got out that that um, that you were pretty much free to teach whatever you wanted to. Um, you were pretty much free to do whatever you wanted to if you were a faculty member. That there was one uh, rule that you could not violate, and that was you could not criticize Yui Long. Um, you could do pretty much anything else, but but you couldn't do that. And and um, and it's kind of odd because I think most faculty members th th thought that was probably not an onerous rule because they weren't inclined to do that anyway. Um, a lot of them weren't political to begin with, and so they weren't. That wasn't a problem for them. Um, but it was a, you know, it was a gross violation of a academic freedom. It was, you know, it was something that that just, if it, that, that, you know, today it would be it would be a clear violation of academic freedom, and we get LSU into twenty different kinds of, of, of problems. But in those days, it was just. I think it, it's kind of odd. I, I found a, 
a survey that that someone that some faculty members did in the, in 1934 of the of the faculty. I think they surveyed about 175 faculty, and you know I think the 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 results were suspect, and certainly the methodology for that survey were suspect. But faculty members, according to this survey, reported that they felt pretty free to they didn't feel Long's influence or Long's you know oppressive influence on their on their work, and that may have been true to some extent. Again, as I say, because. Um, just not criticizing the governor is the only thing that you're not allowed to do. Uh, to a lot of them, probably didn't seem to be that big of a that big of a problem. But um, the, what really brought it to a head was the story that that I that I told in, in answer to your previous question was when it became clear that he was that, that he was not only punishing um, faculty members but was punishing uh, students. Uh, the student newspaper, student journals. That, that 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 I think that was that really crossed a a line for a lot of people in and around Baton Rouge and nationally who, who saw that I mean, the, the, the criticism that he got across the country for that was just, it was just withering. And it, and it really showed that he didn't really understand, I think, how much damage he was doing because he, he, he could have mitigated it. He could have backed off and he really doubled down in a way that was, that was making the situation even worse. All right. Now, you mentioned earlier that Long's death helped in many ways save LSU from potentially losing its accreditation. Um, but even after Long's death, uh, some of his uh, some of his political allies, some of his allies at LSU were still embroiled in scandals that were in large ways connected to him, despite his uh, having passed away. So who all got taken down by these scandals after Long passed away, and how was LSU affected by these scandals that affected uh, his his allies? So what happened by by 1938-39, um, the president that Long had selected, James Monroe Smith, who by all accounts was, was was a pretty good president in a lot of ways, pretty effective in his job, and was a, hired good people. Um, but one thing he didn't he didn't do, and LSU didn't do, was they did they had almost no um, uh, the financial controls of the university. There were there were a lot of uh, offices and accounts that were not being uh, audited or or even looked at by any central authority at LSU. And so a lot of people had they were they were dealing a lot of, they were dealing in cash and it wasn't being properly accounted for. There was just a lot of people raking raking off the top. Um, there were the the building program was being. Because Long didn't trust, it's a long story, but Long didn't didn't really think that the the the, the contractors in town were giving were giving bids that he thought were reasonable. So LSU began to manage its own construction instead of contracting it out, and they hired people to do that. Well, the guy they hired to do that was taking a kickback, a two percent kickback from the the subcontractors for the work that he was doing. So he was ripping off the school, and no one caught that for several years. And then the president. James Monroe Smith began to um, play the stock market in in really kind of reckless and dangerous ways, and and he covered his losses by um, falsifying uh, LSU board minutes to uh, authorize him to take out bank loans, and he gave himself a pay raise uh, by falsifying those minutes, and you know did a lot of other stuff. And then uh, um, Smith and other uh, other employees of the university. Were, were ripping off the university of building materials to build homes for themselves. And that extended to the governor, the long organization governor, Dick Lesh, who became the governor after O.K. Allen um, died and left and left office. And, and uh, he was ripping off the state. So within a two-day period, the, the president of the university, um, James Monroe Smith, resigned and fled the country. He had to be extradited back from Canada. The following day, Dick Lesh, the governor, resigned in disgrace, and a couple of dozen people end up going to prison for um, various crimes involving uh, how they were stealing and r- robbing for LSU. The most, the most outrageous example of, of how loose everything was to me was that early on in Long's uh, time running LSU, they they uh, hire a new business manager for the university, the guy to run all the you know sort of oversee all the finances of the university. And he was a he was a, a crony, a friend of Long's from Winfield, and the, he had no college degree. He had gone to Louisiana Tech and taken a few business courses, 
but the but the largest organization, the largest business that he had ever managed was a was a small grocery store in Winfield, and they and they put him in charge of the of the business affairs for an for a state for a major state university. He was just unqualified for the job, and he was one of the people that ended up going to prison in in, in 1940 for stealing from the university. So how did these scandals and his allies being taken down? How did this? reshape the notion of prolong versus anti-long um, after his death. We've we've touched on this a little bit that in his life, a lot of uh, during his lifetime, a lot of people in Louisiana would be divided along prolong and anti-long factions. How did these scandals reshape that notion? Because even for decades after Huey Long's passing, um, it wasn't so much about Democrats versus Republicans or any other sorts of categorization in Louisiana. In a lot of ways, it was still pro-long versus anti-long. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the more I research this, I'm writing another book that deals with a lot of that post Huey Long era, the 40s and 50s and 60s. And one of the things I've learned is that, you know, when people call themselves anti-Long, basically all, all I can tell they really meant is they weren't aligned with the Long people. That their, 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 their political philosophy um, might have been a little bit different. They, I think so. One of the ways that, that I would describe it is that you, you probably were more, if you were anti-Long, you were probably more supportive of uh, you know, good government reforms, more accountability in government, a civil, you know, a civil service system, ethics rules and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it didn't mean that you were any less, uh, that you're any more willing to abide by those ethical rules <laughs> than the other people. Um, because I think what happened is that, you know, what Long was doing, what, what his organization was doing in the, in the, in the thirties and early forties was so popular with the public that even the anti-longs supported a lot of that. I mean, it became uncontroversial to provide these services. And so that when you called yourself anti-long, it really, it, you know, that, well, I, I think it's really hard to, to define what that means because you weren't opposing long's programs. You were, the, the best I can tell is you were, you were pretending to be, a, you were saying you were, you were for reforming the government, even though in many cases, somebody like Jimmy Davis is a good example of, of somebody who sort of, claimed the reformer mantle. But when you sort of back away and look at what he accomplished, there weren't that all that many reforms. It was just, it was just an a, a you know sort of a long agenda disguised as an anti-long agenda that that was you know maybe marginally less corrupt. But um it it was it what and that's that's to me the one of the stories of this book is that 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 there was a lot of corruption, there was a lot of authoritarian control. But in the end, these people delivered uh, results that 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 made a lot of what he did supported by by both sides and by, by almost the entire political spectrum in Louisiana for a, a generation or two. Um, this it, it, I think it's a testament to how poorly government was was providing for the public good before long came along that even as corrupt and um and disgraceful some of the actions were that it was that that it didn't fully um discredit them in the public's mind that they, that that you know even after the louisiana scandals when all these people go to prison that um that, that the the public is still willing to elect members of the long organization into the 19 into the late 1950s to run louisiana government all right well this has been a you know fascinating look at Huey Long and his influence in LSU and his influence on the state of Louisiana more broadly. Uh, obviously, as we've touched on, a figure whose legacy is still very relevant today um, and who is still greatly significant, um, a figure who has uh, some cultural significance beyond Louisiana. All the King's Men, the Robert Penn Warren novel from 1946, and then the the Best Picture winning um, film adaptation of, in 1949. Um, those are both based in a lot of ways on Huey Long, even though the the protagonist is named Willie Stark. It's based on Huey Long, so this is someone who, um, in his lifetime, shortly thereafter, was very culturally significant outside of Louisiana, but of course very relevant uh, still in Louisiana today and very divisive still in Louisiana today. Um, so before we wrap up, because 
he is a figure whose legacy still looms so large. And because he is in a lot of ways a divisive and controversial character all these years after his passing. Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on regarding his legacy, either um, you know, pro Huey Long or anti Huey Long, that you feel like we really need to to add to this conversation for listeners to consider? Yeah, thanks for asking that question because I, I think you know I, I'm always trying when I'm talking to people try to find a way to relate it to our current politics and what um, we can what we can learn from UE and you know LSU is a is a school that's got a lot of problems. It's I think it's chronically underfunded, especially compared to the athletic program, and and you know needs in the libraries in a disgraceful condition. And um, the the one thing that that I think we can learn from from Yui Long, and I wish that the leaders, the people running the state, would would appreciate, is that you can do both. That you don't have to do one or the other. We don't have to choose. Some I think in, in, around here at LSU, we 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 fool ourselves into thinking, well, we can have good football. We can really emphasize this, but but we're going to have to do it at the expense of of the academics. And 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 Long showed that you can do it both. That you can do both. That they actually complement each other. That's not a choice. That they're, they 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 it's all part of the whole. Uh, and that honestly, you shouldn't do just the athletics. That if you're just if you're just giving people, um, uh, you know, a, a good entertainment on Saturday, but not providing anything for the state, the rest of the the rest of the week, educating young people that that ultimately the 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 the, 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 the overall university is going to. Um, not only losing stature, but I think fall into into um, uh, d- maybe not disrepute, but it's going to lose public support. And I think that's what's happened in Louisiana, in Louisiana because we've neglected the athletic, we've neglected the academic side so much that it's it's become all about football. And that's just a really, I think, a really dangerous um, uh, situation to, to get your team into because or to get your school into because you know one or two bad football seasons. And you got nothing else to to lean on, you know. I mean, you're you're you're. Why would you want to make your the the success of your of your college all about the the success or failure of one sport? And I think Long would find that just appalling, and he would do something about it. And I just find uh, I just wish that you know I tell people I I want I would I, I want to inject in our leaders a little bit of Long's uh, urgency, maybe not his tactics, but his urgency to uh, to make the school a better a better school. He would not abide. He would walk around this campus and be shocked and appalled and he would do something about it. And instead, our leaders walk around this campus and say, well, I guess we need to build a bigger facility for the football players. That's really all we can raise the money for. So let's just do that. And I think that's just a, 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 a you know, it sends a terrible signal to the people of the state and to the people of the country. They're not going to respect LSU if it's all about football, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a false promise and we've been beguiled by it. And I think we need to break that. And, uh, and I'm hoping that my book shows people that we can, ha- we can have both. We don't have to choose one or the other. All right. Well, definitely uh, some interesting food for thought there. Again, the book we've been discussing is Kingfish U, Huey Long and LSU. And the website, as we mentioned earlier, is kingfishu.com. Uh, Bob, you mentioned that you're working on another book right now. Uh, so can you take a minute, tell us about this book that you're working on currently, um, as well as uh, are there any other places that you would recommend listeners go if they want to learn more about your work or about uh, Huey Long in general? Uh, yeah, so thanks. Uh, so my my the book that uh, I'm working on now is is uh, the working title is "You Are My Sunshine," Jimmy Davis and the biography of an American song. It's the how this governor, uh, co- member of the Country Music Hall of Fame, two time governor of Louisiana, used uh, used his music used and used one particular and one song in particular to uh, get himself uh, elected governor uh, twice, once in the '40s and once in the early '60s. All right. Well, uh, hopefully once that book comes out, uh, I'll be able to have you back on the show. We can talk about Jimmy Davis and talk about that book in more detail. Uh, But I want to remind everybody for now that the show notes page for today's episode is placesandprofiles.com slash 10. Uh, So there will be links to Kingfish U, the book and the website um, and some other resources there, placesandprofiles.com slash 10. 10. That's the place to go, the show notes page for today's episode. Um, And again, Bob, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today, for being so generous with your time, and for helping us take a look at Huey Long, his significance to the state of Louisiana, and his significance to Louisiana State University. So thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. It's been a delight. 
thank you for listening to today's episode of the Places and Profiles podcast. Please visit placesandprofiles.com to subscribe and listen to more episodes. Come back again soon, and thanks for listening.